Hi, I am Professor Goodmanson. This video is intended for my students in my aircraft design class at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, where I currently teach. The video presents excerpts from my textbook, General Aviation Aircraft Design, Applied Methods and Procedures. Its purpose is to supplement my class lectures. The book is available online from a large number of outlets, for instance Elsevier and Amazon. It is recommended for anyone interested in the design of general aviation aircraft. This video continues the discussion of airspeeds that I started in part 1. If you haven't seen that video, I strongly urge you to view that first as it is intended to help the viewer get an intuitive sense for the various types of airspeeds the aircraft designer must use. In summary, I discussed three important airspeeds in part 1, equivalent airspeed, true airspeed and ground speed. This part will now consider the topic from a theoretical perspective. Now we will go through the theory of airspeed measurements. I will cover this fast. Should you not be able to keep up with me, you can always rewind for a review. Note that I have put the number of the slides I use in the upper right corner to help you keep track of progress and refer to slides later. The discussion assumes you have already taken classes in aerodynamics and thermodynamics. Let's start with some elementary definitions. First notice the airspeed names and symbols. When using airspeeds in knots, I write it as K followed by the type of airspeed. I want to recite for you how I pronounce these airspeeds in this video, regardless of how others may pronounce it. Thus, the unit for the equivalent airspeed in knots is spelled K-E-A-S. I pronounce it KEAS. Similarly, I pronounce the unit of knots for the true airspeed as KTAS. I pronounce the indicated airspeed as KIAS and the calibrated airspeed as KCAS. Regardless of how this sounds, this should allow you to distinguish audibly between these airspeeds. Also note the standard AC level values for the atmospheric properties. You can refer back to them by rewinding if you need to. Now let's talk about Mach numbers. The Mach number is defined as the true airspeed divided by the speed of sound, denoted by A. Using the continuity equation and Euler's equation of motion, we can show that A is given by the equation shown. Therefore, we can write the Mach number as follows. Note that sometimes we use the speed of sound at sea level and standard atmosphere. When this happens, we denote this value using the subscript 0, as in A0. Next, let's talk about the well-known incompressible Bernoulli equation, shown here in an extended form. This equation is introduced to all students of aerospace engineering in their first aerodynamics course. I want to stress that the airspeed in this equation is the true airspeed. Therefore, for clarity, I like to write it as shown. Note that the term rho times g times z is used to account for elevation changes. We don't have to deal with these in airspeed theory for the simple reason that elevation changes are so minute that they can be ignored. Therefore, let's rewrite the equation in a more concise form. Also note that the pressure and density are the far field values, which simply means they are measured far enough away from the airplane not to be affected by its own pressure field. It is of importance to recognize that the incompressible Bernoulli equation can be used to calibrate our airspeed indicator. To do this, we write the equation for two points in the flow. The one to the left of the equal sign is the energy state in the far field, and the one to the right is the energy state at the opening of the pitot tube. I will refer to it using TOT to indicate the total pressure, which here is the stagnation pressure. Stagnation pressure means that the airspeed denoted by VTOAD is zero. This allows us to simplify the equation and write. Therefore, if we know the difference between the total, or stagnation pressure, and the far field static pressure P, we can calculate the true airspeed required to generate it. And this is precisely what our airspeed indicator does mechanically. Then, let's denote this pressure difference by delta P and write the true airspeed as shown. The term delta P is the dynamic pressure and is usually denoted by the letter Q. Therefore, we can use the previous equation and write, since our reference flight condition refers to sea level and standard atmosphere, we call the airspeed at that condition the equivalent airspeed, like we talked about in part one. The dynamic pressure associated with that flight condition is given by 
Now, we usually fly at altitudes greater than sea level and thus it is of interest to know the true airspeed, VTAS, that precisely yields the above dynamic pressure. This is of interest because that airspeed is used to determine how long it will take us to fly from A to B. And we write it as follows. This allows us to derive the following relationship between the equivalent and true airspeed, where sigma is the density ratio. By the 1930s, some airplanes were already flying fast enough to encounter a noticeable error in airspeed measurement. These problems were generally recognized as compressibility errors. The fix for the airspeed indication was permitted by the use of the so-called compressible Bernoulli equation. The derivation of this equation is presented to undergraduate students of aerospace engineering as well. Here the constant gamma is the heat capacity ratio of specific heats, that is the ratio of the heat capacity of air at constant pressure to the heat capacity at constant volume. It is also possible to determine the true airspeed using this expression, just like we did for the incompressible Bernoulli equation, although it is considerably more complicated. We start again by writing the equation for two points. The one to the left of the equal sign is the far-field condition, and the one to the right is at the opening of the pitot tube. Now tote indicates the total pressure and density at the stagnation point. The next step requires the use of the so-called isentropic equation of state, which students are introduced to in the thermodynamics class but it allows the far field and stagnation pressure to be related as shown here. Then we use this to solve for the stagnation density, because we are going to eliminate it from the compressible Bernoulli equation shown earlier. Then we substitute this into the compressible Bernoulli equation as shown. Further manipulations lead to, and then rearranging terms, the interested viewer can pause here to look at each step more closely. Then recall the speed of sound is given by substituted into the previous form of the Bernoulli equation to get then use the definition of the Mach number to rewrite this as shown. Since the total pressure is the far field static pressure plus the dynamic pressure this becomes therefore if we know the pressure difference, that is, the dynamic pressure, we can determine the Mach number at which it must be generated. Therefore, an initial conclusion is that we can measure the Mach number by measuring the pressure difference between the pitot and static pressure ports. To get the airspeed at which we're flying, simply multiply this Mach number by the speed of sound at altitude. Unfortunately, there is a problem. We have to calibrate our airspeed indicator, just like we did for the one that uses the incompressible Bernoulli equation. And for the sake of standardizing the process, it is best to do this at sea level and standard atmosphere. Therefore, we must use the pressure and the speed of sound at sea level, P0 and A0, respectively. Inevitably, this calibrated airspeed will have a different value than if we were to use the value of P and a at our operational altitude. It is important to distinguish between this airspeed and the equivalent airspeed. And this is done by calling it calibrated airspeed. Substituting the pressure and speed of sound leads to... Therefore, the calibrated airspeed is simply... It is possible to solve the previous equation for the dynamic pressure. Doing so results in where M0 is the Mach number at sea level. We have now shown that the calibrated and equivalent airspeeds are given by... Thus, it is possible to show that the calibrated and equivalent airspeeds are related as follows. These are equations 1627 and 1628 in my book. That aside, the above equation states that the equivalent airspeed equals the calibrated airspeed corrected for compressibility effects. In fact, compressibility results in greater pressure recovery in the pitot tube than happens in incompressible flow. In other words, compressibility causes a magnification effect in the stagnation pressure, and if not corrected, 
the airspeed indicator will indicate the airplane is flying faster than it actually is. The effect is analogous to the rise in total air temperature, or RAM air temperature, as expressed by the isentropic relation below. Now let's compare the incompressible and compressible Bernoulli equations. Let's determine the equivalent and calibrated airspeeds required to generate 300 pounds per square foot of dynamic pressure at 25,000 feet using the appropriate Bernoulli equations. Note that the density of air at that altitude is 0.001066 slugs per cubic foot. The solution is shown for each methodology. Remember, you can pause to see the details. The result tells us that to generate a given dynamic pressure takes a greater value of equivalent than calibrated airspeed. Another way of putting it is to say, the dynamic pressure associated with the calibrated airspeed is always larger than associated with the same value of the equivalent airspeed. This fact is very important to the aircraft structural analyst. Air loads based on the calibrated airspeed appear greater than they really are. And that's an opportunity to not increase the airplane's empty weight unnecessarily. For this reason, all aircraft certification loads, and as can be seen in the so-called VN diagram, assume equivalent airspeed. Let's do another example. An airplane is equipped with an airspeed indicator calibrated using the incompressible Bernoulli equation. While flying close to sea level on a standard day, the indicator shows 400 knots. Determine the calibrated airspeed and compare to the indicated airspeed. First note that if we assume the instrument is perfectly accurate, then set airspeed should be equivalent. This means the dynamic pressure should be 542 pounds per square foot, as shown below. Since this airspeed is close to Mach 0.6, let's use the compressible airspeed methodology. This yields the following value for the calibrated airspeed. Therefore, the airspeed indicator overestimates the airspeed by 4.3%. In other words, the airspeed indication system is telling us we are flying faster than we actually are. It is of interest to plot the effect compressibility has on airspeed as a function of altitude. This is shown in this graph, which shows true and equivalent airspeed as a function of altitude, resulting from a fixed calibrated airspeed. This is analogous to the pilot maintaining said airspeed, here 350 knots calibrated from sea level to, say, 30,000 feet, as shown. This can be accomplished by maintaining a constant dynamic pressure up to that altitude. Then the calibrated airspeed is calculated using the equation on slide 12. As the altitude increases, the Mach number increases too, and with it, the magnification effects due to compressibility. We can determine the Mach number using the fixed dynamic pressure with the center equation on slide 11. Knowing the speed of sound at the given altitude, we can then calculate the true airspeed using the bottom equation on the same slide. Then, we use the equation on slide 6 to calculate the equivalent airspeed. This graph shows that the equivalent airspeed, which contains the true magnitude of the aerodynamic forces, indeed reduces with altitude, assuming a fixed calibrated airspeed. It is also of interest to note the uncorrected true airspeed, represented using the dashed curve. It is based on the false assumption that calibrated airspeed is close enough to the equivalent airspeed to interchange the two. That assumption is only valid at low airspeeds, such as those at which many general aviation aircraft operate. It can be seen that if that assumption were to be applied while doing 350 knots calibrated at 30,000 feet, the true airspeed would be overestimated by some 40 knots. It could lead to a disaster by an underestimation of necessary fuel to complete a mission. Finally, I present here the general approach for obtaining the true airspeed from indicated airspeed using both an incompressible and compressible methodologies. I hope this video has helped you better understand the difference between the various types of airspeed the aircraft designer must contend with. If so, I hope you'll give the two videos thumbs up rating on YouTube. Thank you for watching.